Today, there are two million descendants of French Canadian immigrants living in New England. These are our stories. Welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Venez tous jeunes filles et garçons, je vais vous raconter l'histoire de notre immigration ici au USA, de grands aventuriers de pays étrangers. This is the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. I am Jesse Martineau. And uh, this episode's guest is a really big one for us. It is Robert Perrault, somebody who I'm sure is very well known to most of the listeners uh, of this podcast. Uh, real legend in the city of Manchester. And when I started Project, uh, Mr. Perrault was the literally the very first name I wrote down as somebody I needed to contact uh, to be a guest on the show. He's the author of both fiction and nonfiction. He teaches at St. Anselm College. And again, somebody I was just been aware of my... Growing up in Manchester, new forever. Honestly believe, something we talk about with my folks always, that the best storyteller. We talk about the history of the Franco-American story in Manchester is Robert Perrault. So it's awesome. It's super exciting for us to have you on the podcast. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled with this interview. I've never had that kind of a, a, an introduction. <laughs> so a legend. Well deserved, I, I don't, I don't, for sure. Absolutely. Now, so we're, obviously I mentioned you're from Manchester. Talk a little bit about, um, I guess, your experience growing up. So wh what part of the town were you from? What was the Franco-American identity like uh, for you in your early life? Well, I was born in L'Hôpital Notre-Dame de Lourdes on the <laughs> west side, which became Notre Dame Hospital and now is CMC. But other than that act, I did not grow up on the west side. I grew up on the east side on Lowell Street. In fact, I grew up one block east uh, of your of your mother. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so Pauline Provence. So and that was in St. George Parish. And so even though Chandler School was right around the corner from my house, my parents said, No, <laughs> our son not is awesome. not gonna go <laughs> where all the neighborhood kids go. You're going to St. George. So I went to St. George where you had to be bilingual from first grade on, you know, because we were there to learn how to read and write the two languages that we were supposed to already be fluent in. Sure. I did have relatives right in the neighborhood, in fact. I had my two sets, my, my, uh, my grandparents, uh, maternal grandparents lived on Ashland Street, not a few blocks from us, sure. and my paternal grandmother, who was a widow, lived also on Ashland Street, but in the other direction. And I had cousins who lived one block away on East High Street. And then we had my uncle, Monon Gérald, who uh, later became president of the ACA, l'Association Canado-Américaine. Uh, and uh, he lived on the west side. So the only gotcha. time we'd go to the west side would be to visit Monon Gérald. So <laughs> the traditional, for those maybe not familiar with Manchester, the west side is what a lot of people think of as the traditional French side of town. Right. But if you look at a map of Manchester, the west side is very small right. in comparison to the east side. And so even though the west side is that small, and we think of the west side as being the Franco-American sure. west side, it's because people were all crunched in together, whereas on the, on the east side, it's huge. And so I think on the east side, they were much more spread out and so there were probably many more Franco-Americans on the east side than on the west side, but it's not as clear as on the west side because they were so close together. And yet, and yet, there were four Franco-American parishes on either side of, of the river, of the Merrimack River. And, by the way, Manchester had more Franco-American parishes than any other city in the United States and sixth in North America after Montreal, Quebec, Trois-Rivières, Sherbrooke, and Ottawa. That is amazing. Yeah. Very cool. And so, and a lot of these parishes, or maybe all of them, I guess, had schools attached. Yeah. They, up. they had schools, yeah. Where, just like St. George, uh, who had to, where the kids, like I said, had to be bilingual. Of course, that was theoretical, because I can remember um, when I entered first grade, there were kids like me who were perfectly bilingual. Sure. There were kids whose families had been in the States for several generations yeah. and perhaps the culture had and the language had been watered down, or maybe it was from a mixed marriage sure. or whatever. And then there were those on the opposite side 
people, new families who were coming in from Quebec, not very many, but just right. a few. And those kids, of course, uh, spoke French and maybe not English as well. And what was we found funny in those days as kids, especially like in the first and second grade, was you would have these big kids like in the seventh and eighth grade who would be in the seventh or eighth grade, whatever, in French, but in English, they'd put them like in first grade or oh, second wow. grade. So the desks are very small. <laughs> so you get these big kids in your in the back of your class, you know, at these small desks. And uh, we, we thought that was pretty funny. And so, so and that was, I mean, I guess that was semi-common then. Uh, for You would go the first through eighth grade with, I guess, was it half the day in each language? Yes, it was half a day. The s state of New Hampshire required that um, like English grammar, spelling, reading, um, geography, history, science, math, all those subjects had to be taught by law in English. Gotcha. With the rest of the day, you could do whatever you wanted. So in some schools, like the public schools or uh, the, the uh, Catholic schools where English was, was the primary language sure. or the only language, they would have gym class, you know, phys ed. Right. They would have uh, maybe art, uh, music. Maybe they would take uh, field trips, go visit the post office and how that works, or the union leader and sure. how that works, that sort of thing. Um, whereas we had French, and that was uh, épellation, spelling, right. grammaire, grammar, lecture, which was reading, and the most important, religion, le catechisme. That was, that was the real reason for the existence of those schools. I mean, because, you know, it, we had that, that old dicton in that saying in Quebec, qui perd sa langue perd sa foi. He who loses his language loses his faith. Sure. So the, that, you know, they really believed that if you, if you um, assimilated and, and, you know, became strictly English speaking, you would probably lose your faith because we prayed in French. Right. And there was a big... <laughs> Uh, there's an emotion, something very emotional about that. In fact, today I know people my age who say, like some of them have forgotten how to speak French or they never speak French, but when they pray, sure. they pray in French. It, there's a real connection, and I think a lot of people don't understand that. And so when they try to uh, assimilate us and say, no, 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 you have to learn English and, and forget about French and all that, uh, they weren't understanding that they, they were they were risking sure. losing us as, as Catholics. So yeah. Yeah, it's, it's funny that you mentioned something like that. Cause I, I distinctly remember when my, when my grandmother died, um, she knew it was coming. So she planned every aspect of her funeral. It wasn't St. George actually St. George was still around at the time. And she wanted the majority to be in English because there was going to be a lot of people who didn't speak French there, including my sister and I, but it was crucial for her that the, our father had to be in French. There was no way that the Our Father at her funeral was going to be said in any language other than French. Just, just like you had mentioned, there was just such a tie between the language and religion. And for I talked to some people yeah. who was, who would be like they didn't realize till they were older that God could speak anything but French. It's just, just assumed well, that was the language. We th we thought. I mean, the nuns never said this, but a lot of us thought because religion was taught in French and all the. Uh, biblical stories were taught in French, and the, the names of the characters, like like Adam and Eve, it wasn't Adam and Eve, it was Adam and Eve, <laughs> sure. and uh, Abraham, and Jacob, and Joseph, and you know, all Isaac, yep. and Moise, not Moses, but yep. Moise. So I thought, and I think some of my friends must have thought, that everything connected with religion and heaven, sure. you know, when you get, when you die and you go to heaven, and St. Peter is there, and, you know, Bonjour St. Pierre, c'est moi Robert Perrault. That's it. Uh, here's St. Peter, and he's going to let me in. And so what happens to those people who don't speak French? And I remember asking my mother the, that kind of a question. Well, I think, you know, God will, you know, if you're a good person, God will let you in. <laughs> and, and and the same thing with Protestants. We I asked, because I had a, an uncle who was Protestant. My, my aunt, my father's sister, yeah. married a Protestant, uh, Ed Flanders, who 
went to uh, the first congregational church and he was very active in his church. He sang in the choir and he was a very good man. And I was worried for him <laughs> because the nuns would say, if you're not Catholic, you don't get to go to heaven. And I can remember sure. going around baptizing every kid, in the, every <laughs> Protestant kid in the neighborhood. I, you know, they said anybody can baptize. So you just throw water on him and say, je te baptise, in French, <laughs> je te baptise au nom du Père et du Fils et du Saint-Esprit. And, uh, you know, that was it. So my mother said, well, I think your Uncle Eddie is, he's a good guy. And I think uh, God will make, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know. Uh, he might be okay. Yeah, yeah, he might be okay. So so, so we thought the official language of heaven sure. was French. So how did we get from, you know, this, to me, seems like super interesting background of having the half the day English, half the day French, really growing up in that French culture. Um to the point where you decided to dedicate your life to telling the Franco-American story. Like, how did that come about? Well, I had to go through some evolution there because, um, of course, growing up in that atmosphere where my grandfather had been president of the ACA, sure. my uncle was president of the ACA, so we had to speak French to them. We spoke exclusively French to them. And because of that atmosphere... Um, I was good in French at school. I had no problem. Like some of those kids that I said in first grade right away were having trouble, I didn't. In fact, when we our first report card came out, uh, they used to rank us. All right. I ranked first <laughs> out of go. like 80 kids, you know, at first grade. We had two classes. I, the first grade each. ranking system's hilarious. Yeah, right. so, so I was first in French, and I didn't even know what that meant. You know, right. I remember everybody's patting me on the back, and here's $5, my uncle, grandfather, my uncle, $5 here. And I'm thinking, I don't know what I did. What did I do? What is it, and what does it mean to be first? And I didn't even understand, but uh, that's just the way it was. Um, and so... Growing up in this atmosphere, I, I almost had to, you know, go in that direction. But along came high school where, first of all, um, I was ridiculed in high school. In grammar school, we're all the same, sure, right? So together, the nuns, right? Yep. the nuns aren't going to ridicule us. But you get to high school and suddenly French is standard French. It's not right. our French, our North American French, which, by the way, at St. George... The nuns spoke to us in a grammatically correct North American French. Okay, sure. so if you said "moi" and "toi," right, which was considered working class, right. uh, you know, and not not good French. Which, by the way, a lot of that is old French. It's very old, seventeenth century French. So that's that's one thing. But if they they would they would correct us. Okay. Yeah. So there was that. Um, so they'd ridicule us, and sometimes the, in, in, high, in high school, teachers who weren't necessarily Franco-American themselves, they were, um, you know, Yankee or Irish or sure. whatever, and they had learned French in college. Right. And il parlait le français de France comme ça. Well, I'm sorry, but that's not le français de France. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an attempt, a sure. poor attempt. Mm. But they would, they would correct us, quote unquote, yeah. and make fun of us. And of course, students made fun of us. I mean, and, and, and students, uh, when I went to Bishop Bradley High School afterwards. Um, I, I'd gone to Assumption Prep for one year in Worcester, Massachusetts. And then I came back sure. and went to, to Bishop Bradley. And I can remember kids saying, oh, you're French. Oh, you you uh, you must live on the west side. Did you uh, jump across the river because oh, you're yeah. a frog? Sure. Or did, did you forget your passport, you know, or, you, you know, to cross the river, whatever, all those kind of jokes. Um, some were vicious yeah. and some were just joking. Like I had friends who were Irish and I gave, I gave it right back to them. <laughs> you know, I wasn't going to put up with that stuff. But uh, some were vicious, and, you know, it, it wasn't nice. So it kind of made us feel lousy about being Franco-American. and But I still, you know, continued taking French and all that, French courses. and um, But this was the 60s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Beatles came along and rock music, and sure. I was a teenager. And I wasn't interested anymore in, in, in being Franco-American. It was, it was just not that I, I hated it, but I shoved it aside. Sure. Okay, so what happens after that? I go to St. Anselm College and took French there. And it was the same story there where, where um, you know, you're learning, you know, to correct your accent, you know, right. 
standard French and all that. But the teacher was Franco-American himself, Monsieur Blais, Roger Blais. And he was a nice guy, and he was from Manchester. And so we kind of went along with it. And, and then he said, you know, uh, you're good in French. You should go to Paris, study in Paris. So I went to Paris. That's awesome. And um, in Paris, I... I was like the only one like me there with a bunch of American students from different places around the country. And people would say, we've never heard of this. I didn't say Franco-American. I, I just never really, I said I'm French. Sure, right, yeah. And, uh, but, but you grew up speaking French at home and you, <laughs> you, you were educated in half a day of French and help me with my homework, you know? Sure. And so I was popular. You became very popular. I was right? very popular with the girls, especially, <laughs> and especially for, um, hitchhiking, you know, you'd go hitchhiking, uh, went to Mont Saint-Michel, went to London, wow. went to the Oktoberfest, <laughs> awesome. went all the way to Rome. Uh, it's a you know, hike. From, it, these yeah. are these are long yes, absolutely. rides, and how do you get? How, what's the best combination? It's always a guy and a girl, you yeah. know. So the girls, we there were thirty three girls in our program and two guys, my roommate That's and me. Pretty good so odds. Yeah, the odds were great. So every weekend <laughs> they would ask us, "Let's go hitchhiking. Who? Where do you want to go?" We had the pick of the girls. That's and the awesome. Pick of the, That's so, a good uh, life right there. Yeah. yeah. So so French <laughs> suddenly had value. Sure. Also in in um, during that period. I had gone to a rock festival in uh, Toronto uh, called Strawberry Fields. It was something like Woodstock, but okay. smaller. A lot of the same, you know, same types of groups, so and stuff. While I was there, I was there with, with three friends from Manchester, guys that I had hung out with in high school, uh, but not from my high school, not from Bishop Bradley. Two of them went to Central, and one went to uh, Memorial. And two of those guys were half Franco-American, okay. and they didn't speak French, neither one of them, and the other guy was Irish. Okay. So here we are at the ro at Strawberry Fields, and all of a sudden, one of my friends comes over, and he says, hey, he says, there are a couple girls over there who, um, one of them dropped some bad acid. She's having a bad trip, <laughs> oh, and uh, she, they don't speak, her friend is like frantic because yeah. she's the other one is sick and all that. And they don't speak English. They only speak French. And you, you speak French, right? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. Well, come on over. So I went over, okay. and and the girls were like, "Oh, vous parlez français? Oh, merci, merci." And then she explains, you know, that we had, you know, she the other one's having a bad trip. Sure. So I said, "Well, look, the medical tent is over here. So I'm going to take you to the medical tent." Right. So I did, and I interpreted for them. And so afterwards, my friends all said, "Bob." you're this is like a different you you know it's like we've wow. never seen a sure you spoke french and you were like a different person you were another bob you know and i said oh that's kind of cool you know and they <laughs> thought wow you know like they're not laughing at me they right, think right, this right. is cool because they can't do it and the other thing was i was seeing hippies hippie girls yeah. speaking french now up to then french for me was this old language sure that my grandparents spoke and it was something you look backwards and suddenly to see these hippie girls who were hippies like me you know i had my shoulder length hair and a big beard and sure. the whole thing and it was like wow this is cool so that gave me another you know experience sure. to to value french and then the third one came after i graduated from saint anselm college this was um 1972 and it was bad as far as the job market was concerned. Yep. And I, in high school, I had worked in the movie theaters. We had movie theaters downtown in those days. And uh, I worked in the movie theaters. Well, what did I do when I, after I graduated? I went back and worked in the movie theaters. Gotcha. You know, uh, as my mother would say, il mop, le, il mop le théâtre avec son diplôme. He's mopping up the theater with his diploma because I was a janitor, a night yeah. janitor, making 75 bucks a week, though. That was sure, good money absolutely. for, for a, 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 but still, you know, he's got a diploma and he's and he's mopping up the theater. That's not exactly what we had in mind when we right. sent you to college. Sure. And one day I see this ad in the paper, research assistant wanted, please apply Manchester Historic Association. Oh, this is interesting. So I go down and, well, I, I sent in my, my resume and I happened to put, that I spoke French. I thought, why not? You know, sure. it's, it it could it it can't hurt, right? 
So they called me in for an interview, and I got hired. And what it was it? It was Tamara Haraven and Randolph Langenbach, who were the future authors of Amiskeg Life and Work, yes, Work in an American absolutely. Factory City. I became their chief, well, eventually chief research assist, interviewed um, plenty of people, uh, about 120 people for their book. Uh, only about 40 people actually uh, went into the book, but but we did. I did about That's 120, awesome. and they did a total. There were about 300 people because they interviewed people as well. And of course, why was I hired? Because who were the people? The majority of people who worked in the mills, sure. Franco Americans. And who were these Franco Americans? They were elderly people who had worked in the mills w uh, until they closed in 1936. So here we were in the in the early 70s. So they're older and yeah. and a lot of them you know are more comfortable in french and and i had not only the french language but i had connections they they knew that i had grown up in manchester and sure. i knew people so i could call people up and you know i remember putting ads in all the church bulletins sure. i thought that was a good way to attract Absolutely. people and uh, to the project and so so those three things okay the rock festival uh with the hippie girls yeah going to france and and you know helping people americans with their homework and being fa them being fascinated sure. with the fact that i spoke french and then being hired by tamara haraven those three things really gave me value you know in having learned french and that's where i was happy suddenly it, it became it became something valuable and i think the fact that I became interested in Manchester history because now, you know, when we were kids learning history in school, our history books, uh, first of all, they were old. Our yeah. history books were old. And, you know, I remember eighth grade, they went up to uh, the 1940s. I think when, when we ended, Roosevelt was president. <laughs> you know, that was it, you know. Sure. So, but they never talked about you know, local history. And I can remember right. sixth sure. grade, Your history, sixth, right? sixth grade history, we studied the American Revolution. And I remember thinking how, wow, history happened 50 miles from my house, the Boston <laughs> Massacre, the Boston Tea yeah. Party, all these things. Sure. And there was never any history about Manchester. And I knew about John Stark only because there was Stark Park with right. the statue, and, and you know, the equestrian statue. And I knew that he had somehow participated in the revolutionary war but we never heard john stark's name mentioned in our history book uh, or anything like that at school but now i was learning that manchester had a history sure. whoa that was so cool so i worked for the for her raven and langenbach until that project was done and then i had done research on the franco-americans for her raven and Langenbach at the ACA library. And now my uncle was president of the ACA, um, so he gave me carte blanche to go in the library and do what I wanted. And there was no librarian. I mean, there was just, there was the library. Sure. And I, I said to him, I says, you know, I said, I, I'd like a job as a librarian. Could you do that for me? And he was a little hesitant because he says, I don't want to be accused of nepotism. But he spoke to his... Um, council and all that and and mm -hmm. they said yeah go go for it you know it'll put somebody there and so that was my i call that my apprenticeship gotcha um uh, you know i worked there from 1975 to 82 i worked for haraven from 73 to 75 and then 75 to 82 at the aca um and so you know just working in that atmosphere and meeting authors you know right and left who are coming in to to do research and myself just exploring the books and taking care of the books and all that and i i just learned so much about being franco-american and i regretted that they didn't teach that when we were in school sure. why why i can still remember studying american history where we learned for example the ex about the explorers like uh, joliette and marquette and uh, La Salle and these all these guys right. out in the Midwest and the Mississippi River and all that kind of stuff. But they never stopped. The nuns never stopped and said, by the way, those guys are French sure. like you guys. Right. You know, this is our history. It isn't just American history. It is our history, you know, as 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 the French in North America. Sure. And so, um, you know, I regretted that, but I was learning it on my own. But I realized that 
what about all all my friends and all my everybody else they're not learning it they're not you know so so i i felt a little bit isolated but you know uh, uh, eventually through the aca i got to meet a lot of interesting people and become involved in different organizations and for example what we're what we're doing right now where are we right now we're in orono maine attending an annual uh, rassemblement or franco gathering and those kinds of events and and groups and whatnot um are are what that's how we get connected sure. not just with people from our own town but from all over new england you get to know who's doing the same work that we're doing sure what you guys are doing uh you know here with this podcast and whatnot so that's that's, <laughs> that's, an, aw- that's an awesome story i didn't realize uh, that you were connected to that ambuscade project that's yeah. that's super neat yeah. i remember I thought. Have you read the book? Yeah, it was assigned to me. But I went. To, I went to school in D.C. I went to the George Washington University, yeah. and I was at a history class in D.C. And they assigned yeah. that book, yeah. and I thought that was the like kind of the, your experience. I thought it was the neatest yeah. thing in the world. Well, it was if, like that was my that was my story. If, that was if, if you read if you read the acknowledgments, in, which you probably didn't because yeah. most people don't I, read. I those usually kinds don't. Of things. You were correct. <laughs> and and secondly, if you read the acknowledgments, but you didn't know me, right. it's just a name. Yeah. So big deal, you know? No, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's very fascinating. But I do want to talk about um, one of your books specifically, um, something that you know, brought to my attention a bit ago with the Franco-American Life and Culture in Manchester, New Hampshire. Now, when did you write that book? When did the idea come about to, to get that book together? Well, I, how would I put this? I had been writing articles for various newspapers and magazines since the 1970s and in 2009 i was contacted by the history press and asked could you put together a book on the franco-americans of manchester now i should say that i had already published a a book with arcadia arcadia publishing um, in charleston south carolina on old manchester postcards vintage postcards And Arcadia was an offshoot of, uh, excuse me, uh, History Press was an, an offshoot of Arcadia. And so they knew about me. Sure. So they asked me, would you like to put this book together? And I thought, at the time I was busy with other stuff. And then I thought, well, you know, I've got all these articles that are in different magazines and newspapers. Um, why not compile all these into a book? And maybe write a couple of new ones as well. There are some original ones that I wrote just for the book. And that way I can get it done in about... Because they they gave me six months to do this. Well, six months is not a lot to do a book. No, not at all. Absolutely. You know, especially if you have nothing. Sure. So I says, well, I've got something. All I have to do uh, uh, is is retype. Because a lot of these were done on a typewriter. You you may not know what that is. (laughs) I'm familiar, sure. Because you're young, but it's this old-fashioned machine. We had one in the house. Okay, fine. (laughs) And also, um, a lot of what I had done uh, were on a a Mac SE, which is something you may not know, but one of the early early computers. Uh, So I did that on the Mac (laughs) SE. Well, now I had to do something a little bit more modern. So I had to retype uh, the whole thing, and plus, as I said, I wrote a couple of of uh, new uh, chapters as well, new articles, and compiled them into the into this book, and it came out in 2010. Outstanding. So, and since that time, um, the the two companies have merged. Got gotcha. you. So most recently, I've I did a book of my own photographs that I shot over a period of 40 some years. Um, I went all over the city taking pictures. All, all the changes from 1971 to 2005. And wow. so I compiled a, a, a selection of those into a book for Arcadia this time. Sure. That came out in 2017. So, uh, And the one thing I like about um, about the book, the, the Franco-American Life and Culture in Manchester, New Hampshire, is... Um, Something that you alluded to. It's a it's a it's a it's a book, but it's a series of like individual stories. There's a ton of stories in that book. You know, you can pick it up. You can read one, two, three. Put it down. Pick it up another day. Read a whole bunch of other stories. Um, together, they tell like you know 
a pretty big picture. But in each individual passage, I think it's super, super neat. And I do want to talk about one of them right now because um, it's something that we've alluded to with the guests on the show before. Um, and it's one of my go-to articles that I've read several times. And that is the Irish in French, what's the beef? That that article right there I thought was super fascinating. Um, and what made you decide that you were going to dedicate one of your stories to kind of that conflict? Well, that's one of the original ones that I wrote for this for this book. Um, what How that came about was the fact that oftentimes when I gave a talk on the Franco-Americans of Manchester, which, by the way, I give for the New Hampshire Humanities. So I go around the state. I give a lot of different talks. Yeah. Grace Metallius, the uh, the, Mills, awesome? yeah. the Mills, uh, collecting vintage postcards, uh, you know, t- to learn about local history. So people would sometimes ask me uh, in the audience, um, could you talk about the Irish and the French? And now, see, I don't really talk about that in that particular talk because that's a talk by itself. Sure. You know? So I would answer, you know, the, give them the short answer. <laughs> and I said to myself, I'm tired of having to do this. I'm going to do it and I'm going to put it in the book. So that way I can tell people and I can sell books besides, <laughs> you know. So, um, you know, there it is. So I sat down. And I wrote it, and I, I, a lot of this, I mean, I did some research for it, but a lot of this research I had done over the years. Yeah. Um, when I did a, a master's in Franco-American studies at Rhode Island College back in the 80s, one of the uh, uh, term papers that I had to write, and this was in French, by the way, was on the Sancinelle movement sure. down in Rhode Island, which is a revolt by some parishioners against the bishop, down there, Bishop Hickey, who wanted to tax the various French parishes, all the parishes, actually, right. but the French parishes, some of whom had their own parochial high schools, and he wanted to tax them so he could take money and build diocesan high schools, which would probably attract students away from the parochial high schools, and they would eventually fail. And in that diocesan high school, they would not be teaching French or French would not have the same impact sure. as in a French parochial school. So they revolted against the bishop and 62 people were excommunicated for from the Catholic Church by Rome for having revolted. Well, that had um, ripple effects in New Hampshire because uh, especially uh, in St. George Parish, our right. parish, because yep. we had an Irish pastor at the time, Monsignor Devoy, who happened to have been born in Quebec, so he spoke perfect French. So he was kind of like a wolf in sheep's clothing, you know. In front of the parents, he would speak French, but to the kids, he'd speak English, and he wanted to anglicize the kids and that sort of thing. And uh, so this newspaper down in Rhode Island, La Sentinelle, whose editor was Elphege Daigneau, who was president of the ACA in Manchester. He would travel between Manchester and Woonsocket. This is back in the 1920s. Wow. Okay? Yeah. Uh, that was a trip. No, absolutely. In, in, in those days. Um, so, you know. An attorney, he, right? By attorney so, by trade. Yeah. Already, so he yeah. knew he knew about the bishop, uh, Bishop Gertin, <laughs> Gertin, Bishop Gertin. <laughs> a French who we guy. thought yeah. was a French guy yeah. w- would favor the French. Well, the bishop was in a precarious situation because his... His position is dependent upon other bishops and the cardinal in Boston and this and that, and they're all Irish. So in order to get a French bishop, you you had to have the approval of the Irish who would go to Rome and say, okay, this guy, he's okay for the bishop, but now he's got to behave himself, and and by behaving himself, it means he can't be favoring the Franco-Americans. He's got to favor everybody, and the politics in those days was we got to anglicize everyone, get all those foreigners, the Polish and the Germans and the Italians and the Portuguese and the French and all others to speak English because we want a strong catholic church because they had been discriminated against in the 19th century sure. when the when the um know nothing yep. movement occurred you know the yankee protestants who attacked uh irish 
churches and, and Irish people who were coming over from the potato famine in Ireland in the 1840s and 50s. Well, they wanted to strengthen the Catholic Church. How do you strengthen a Catholic Church if people are divided? You know, they, they right. speak different languages, they have different cultures. But this went against the grain as far as Franco-Americans were concerned. The Quebecois in Quebec had this notion of survivance, yep. that is, you know, ethnic and, and cultural survival. And they brought that idea down with them to New England. And so that went right against them. And also the, the politics, church politics. In Canada, the churches were run on a local basis. Right. They, there would be a pastor and a you know local council so they made all the decisions here it was the bishop who ran things you know the bishop there's a, a thing called corporation soul which gives legal right to the bishop to own all church property he is the, the owner so he gets to rule so they didn't get along the french and the irish that was one reason another reason they didn't get along and that date dates back to those 1840s 1850s as well right is work sure because the irish when they came down to work in the mills they were the first unskilled people to work in the mills the and when when the, the mills were young you had yankee workers you had workers who came over from england and scotland and germany and sweden who were expert weavers right. expert spinners expert dyers expert whatever and suddenly you've got this huge influx of several million uh, Irish Catholics who are from farms and, you know, they've got this potato famine going on and they're poor and they're unskilled. And so um, they want, they're not paid great wages, right, right. you know. Yep. So they're fighting for great wages. And they finally were able to, because they were so populous, they were able to, uh, get great wages. Yep. All of a sudden, all this influx of Canadians, French Canadians, come in, and they're just willing to work. They want a job, Setting you know, back because things all things are going for, lousy sure. up in Canada. You know, since England conquered New France, the French are becoming second-class citizens in the very country that they founded. Sure. And so they want to, and, and, and ec politically and economically, things aren't going well. So they're heading down to the mills because they know that the mills need workers. And uh, the, the mill owners are happy because, right. hey, we can get those French people to come in and work for cheaper uh, salaries. And uh, they're, quote unquote, industrious and docile, you know, <laughs> which is an, a, a, a kind of a nice way yeah. to insult them. I was just saying, that's not you know, super complimentary. You know, yeah. Exactly. So um, the Irish, you know, didn't get along with them because they're, they're taking jobs away. So they're on those two fronts, work and a church, those on those two fronts, uh, they, they didn't get along. And what happened was once two groups don't like each other well their children don't like each other sure. or the parents will say well you can't marry an irishman or you can't marry a frenchman or whatever because you know blah 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 and you go down the generations and pretty soon we don't like them because they're irish we don't like them because they're french but why we don't know why you know they've forgotten right. they don't know sure. their history so i wrote that to try to not to revive anything because i don't want to revive any kind of a rivalry or anything i mean at this point the two cultures i think are so watered down that it doesn't even matter there have been so many mixed marriages i mean right. i knew That's kids true. in at saint george grammar school for example who uh kids named uh sullivan uh you know whatever you sure. know i shay you know and the mother was franco-american you know, so the kids grew up speaking French, but they had Irish fathers with Irish names, obviously. Um, you know, so, so, and these kids didn't necessarily know why they shouldn't, you know, there's something going on there. This, in some cases, I've had people tell me, my grandparents stopped speaking to my parents because my parents married and they were French and Irish. One sure. is French, one was, yeah. and which is sad because sometimes grandparents were cut off of course from from their grandchildren i think that's pretty much over with 
you know? I would hope But so. you know what's funny is I developed a talk that goes along with that chapter. I don't do it for the humanities. I'm giving it pretty soon for, uh, in the month of May for the OLLI program at uh, Granite State College. It's a private okay. deal. But people signed up, like within a day, they signed up and the class was full. Not surprised. Now I'm going to have to redo it in, uh, <laughs> in, in the fall semester. Now, so one thing that I thought was super interesting that I was – that I was not entirely aware of before I started this project um, was the fact that a lot of a lot of Irish came to Quebec. Yes, and that you note that there were French speakers in Manchester yes. with the name Fitzpatrick. That's right. That's absolutely right. The reason was that um, it cost more money to uh, migrate from or to sail whatever sure. from Ireland to um, Boston or New York. But to go to Halifax, Nova Scotia, was a lot cheaper. Gotcha. So some of them, they're poor, right? Yeah, so of they're course. So they go to Halifax. And they get to Halifax, and who's who's living there? The Scots and the Irish, and I mean, excuse, excuse me, the Scots and the English, and these, these are the enemy. Sure, you know? right. These aren't, you know? So they go to Quebec, where, you know, they don't have any any beef against the Quebecois, and they get along really well with the Quebecois. They're both Catholic and all that, and um, common enemies. No, yeah. no, and they have a common enemy in the English, so they get along fine. And then after several generations, they get assimilated into the Quebecois culture, and so you got people like Fitzpatrick who are just like everyone else coming down to places like Manchester, and uh, you know one one of the uh, uh, Fitzpatrick, uh, his name was uh, La Terrière Fitzpatrick. Okay, that tells you something, sure. right? Uh, and his sister was Lucy, Lucy Fitzpatrick, who taught French at Central. That's How's awesome. That? So, and then there was Irene Farley, who yeah. uh, founded the Les Rosiers Missionnaires de Saint Thérèse, the the missionary rose bushes of Saint Teresa, who uh, were um, collecting um, funds to send to the missionaries, uh, missionary countries to have people in the third world countries educated to become priests. That's awesome. You know, and they're located in the, um, pre with the Precious precious Blood gotcha. uh, Sisters on uh, Bridge Street Extension. So, sure. uh, but she founded that. <laughs> and Farley happens to be a name in my genealogy. When I, you know, did my genealogy, sure. I discovered some Farleys and I thought whoa this is interesting <laughs> that's gonna be so a story got, there yeah and, I, and and you know what what is is I told this to my uncle who was president of the ACA <laughs> oh uh, it's got to be wrong it's got to be wrong that can't be we're, we're pure French we're pure French oh well then how come we have a Marie Canada in there Marie Canada has got to be native yeah you know, she's got to be native and we even have some Drews, D-R-E-W-S. Okay. What's all that about? That's Yankee. Sure. Well, I think the only way I can trace this would be when they had Indian raids. Oh, you know, right. They would yeah. come down sure. from Quebec and they'd kidnap Yankee, Yankee farmers or whatever, sure. bring them up to Canada, hold them for ransom. And some of these people d were never ransomed. And they ended up marrying Quebecois or married Native Americans or whatever. Sure. So I think that's probably how we ended up with uh, Yankees in our in our background. This is way back. Yeah, though, that's way super back. interesting. But my though. uncle, he, <laughs> he was, wouldn't he, have gone for was, that. <laughs> and my grandfather would be turning in his grave. You know, I I think it's cool. Yeah, I, for I, sure. You know, but so. I, did, I did want to note something that absolutely caught my attention was it because I knew that you know you hear about. My dad's family not celebrating uh, St. Patrick's Day. That was just not going to be a thing. But it was more than just kind of like ill will. There was you knew know the newspaper stories tell vandalism, beating, street riots, gang wars, even a homicide. There was there was very real impact because of this disagreement between the two sides. Oh yeah, there was a famous murder. Well, I I wouldn't exactly call it a murder. I'd say it's more like manslaughter, where um, these. Um, Irish guys were going up uh, Amherst Street, right around where the uh, Rex Theater, the you know what used to, well you wouldn't know no. that the, well actually it's it, the Rex Theater is now being renovated into uh, it's going to be I think the Palace Theater is involved with that okay. uh, on Amherst Street yep. you know uh, 
and in the back alley, Nutfield Lane there and sure. stuff. I had worked there. Yep. It's one of the theaters I worked in. Um, they, these Irish guys were walking up the street, and I think they were drunk, whatever. And there was a guy named uh, John Bl Blanchett who was uh, standing on the corner of Vine and, and uh, Amherst. Sure. And a, a fight broke out, and uh, somebody broke a bottle uh, of liquor or whatever, and they flung it at him. And the broken bottle hit him in the neck, oh, and he wow. bled right there. Right to he just wow. bled, it hit him in the jugular, and he, he bled to death. And he's buried in St. Augustine's Cemetery. Um, I don't, I wouldn't call that murder exactly. Sure. I'd say it was more of a, you know, an accident. I mean, it's not an accident. No, but right. I mean, it's, I don't, I don't know that they meant to kill him, but you know, whatever. No, so, no, that's fascinating. So there was that kind of thing, and you know, I've heard stories of riots. You know, people gangs would go to the Irish neighborhood and or gangs of French of Irish would go to the French neighborhood on the west side whatever and uh, they one lady told me oh she says yeah they put up they would take doors unscrew the doors and bring them down and they'd make barricades across the street you know to keep to them keep out the and that sort of thing and no it's so. somebody growing up in Manchester now would have absolutely no idea that this was our history which yeah is, it's pretty fascinating. But sure. we can do this forever. There's about 100 yeah. million stories we could tell. Yeah. But I want to make sure to get across. Uh, you mentioned you still give talks. Is there some place people can go if they want to see you give a presentation on any one of these on any one of these various topics? Or how would they be able to reach you, know, reach you to be able to find out you know, where they can see you speak? I, the best thing to do would be to go on the Humanities Council. Gotcha. Uh, calendar the New Hampshire Humanities at uh, nhhc.org uh, and uh, or just type humanities New Hampshire Humanities and uh, they can look on their calendar um, and plus whatever organization is hiring me through the humanities they would advertise as well so you know if it's a library sure. or you know a, a historical society or a church group um, you know, whatever, and I give them all over the state, so that's you know that's the that's really the only way I can say it. You know, once in a while it'll be in the newspaper as well if they want to advertise it sure. in the newspaper. Um, so that's that's the way. The it best is. way to catch it. Yeah. Now, and um, are all the books available through Amazon? Is that the probably the easiest way to get you through? Yeah, through Amazon or what? What I prefer actually is go down to the uh, gift shop at the Milliard Museum. There you go, sure. Because there you'd be supporting a local uh, entity um, or, or the bookery. Sometimes the bookery uh, will... The oh, the new, new one on Elm the Street? New, the new, yeah, they've, sure. They've carried my books. Barnes & Noble carries my books. Um, of course, the bookery is independent, so, right. you know, they're, they're our store, <laughs> you know. So, um, you know, and... Um, Roger Lacerte at his French uh, bookstore on Orange Street, he has carried my books in the past, so I imagine he's still... And you do have books in French. And I do have some books in French as well. I published several, uh, including uh, a novel called L'Héritage. This goes back to the 1980s um, about, Man about Manchester. It takes place in Manchester. Um, but the French books are, are out of print. They were all They were all printed by this publisher called the National Materials Development Center for French, which uh, was located in Bedford at first and then in Manchester in, in Pinardville uh, back in the 70s and 80s. And they were publishing French books, both original French books and books, older French books that had gone out of print, which they reprinted. And uh, so I did uh, four books with them. So I did a, uh, a, a biography of a poet in Lowell, Massachusetts. I did a book on the Sancinelle yep. and how that affected Manchester, that quarrel I said before sure. between the Irish and the French. And um, a book about the election of 1908. Uh, that was something for a political thing okay. uh, that my professor wanted me to do. <laughs> These are all term papers, gotcha. except that my professor was, uh, he liked long term papers, so they ended up being <laughs> being books. And of course, the novel that I just yeah. mentioned, so those four books. But uh, anyway, that's That's, that's awesome. It. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you so much for joining us. This has been really fun. We're going to put links 
where people will be able to get your books on all, all our social media sites. And hopefully we can keep people posted. And when we find out you're going to be speaking somewhere so people can know and be able to catch you. Um, if you have the opportunity uh, to see Robert Perrault give a talk, it's something you absolutely have to attend. I know my folks come out every time they see him because there, it's never a bad show when he's giving a presentation. So thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. We really appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Now our fathers look at us and sigh with despair To think that everything they love we simply do not share But the spirit never dies, our culture will survive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive Special thanks to Josie Vashon for providing the music. You can find more about her at josievashon.com. This podcast was produced and edited by Mike Campbell. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at fclpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at FCL Podcast for more information about the topics discussed. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this episode. This program is recorded at the Conquer TV Podcasting Studio. The views and opinions expressed during this podcast are not necessarily those of Conquer TV. The producer is solely responsible for its content.